Thank you, Irvin. Uh, always a pleasure uh, to be uh, introduced by a pastor and a church leader of Irvin's repute, but we also share a discipline, an academic discipline, and that is rhetoric, and got to know each other uh, well before uh, coming here, so uh, feels good. Thank you again. Well, good morning, and it is a beautiful morning, finally. It is a distinct pleasure to be worshiping with you today at Parkview Mennonite Church. As Irvin said, my name is Susan. I am president of Eastern Mennonite University, and I am pleased that uh, Jesse, my husband, could also be here with me today. You know, the presidency, folks, is a partnership, and we together are honored to serve this remarkable university 20 months and counting. I am guessing that it must feel good to be back in your worship space. Though we were happy to provide room for you on campus during the construction, among other things, it was a good reminder of our shared identities. One of many enriching stories I learned uh, about EMU last year as we celebrated our centennial is that Parkview Mennonite Church was founded in the 50s as the campus church of then EMC and met in Lehman Auditorium. It was not until 1968 that Parkview became independent of the college and built its own facility right here. Shared histories are important. I want to thank Phil Niss, your pastor, for the invitation to bring the message this morning. We at EMU have many connections with members of this church, students, alums, supporters, faculty and staff, former presidents and former board chairs. Currently, we have nine students at EMU from Parkview. What a gift. We are thankful. This morning, I'd like to reflect on a big, all-encompassing topic, love. The pinnacle Christian virtue modeled by our triune God of the Bible. I'd also like to reflect on another big all-encompassing topic of the Bible, judgment. These two words we often use as opposites today. We either show the love to one another or we get all judgy with one another. It's shalom or shame. Though sometimes we do talk about tough love, usually in disciplining wayward children. If you are following the lectionary for this Sunday, you will note that all five passages emphasize to one degree or another the way love and the law, generosity and justice coexist in God's plan for us. How prescient that the lectionary readings happen to coincide with the high stakes judgment days from the Judiciary Committee of the U.S. Senate over the next Supreme Court nominee. I don't know that what we've witnessed qualifies as an example of a community holding these two virtues, love and judgment, together Though amidst the rancor, dare I say, there have been a few precious moments of reconciliation. Well, I want to share with you one of my favorite stories of love from the Bible. And yes, it is the story of Ruth, Naomi, and Boaz, a story steeped in judgment as well. Now, as you have heard from our wonderful scriptural reenactment, our budding thespians, and I thought I heard some clapping, so I would like to thank them for that rendition. That, that book of Ruth is so riveting uh, to so many in so many ways. Ruth is the consummate story of loss and love and redemption. It celebrates extraordinary acts of love and generos generosity within the confines of some really harsh laws and by our standards today, some very cruel customs. It is an astonishing and inspirational tale of compassion, courage, and grace 
in the midst of darkness and tragedy, the very best of the human spirit and God's grace shines brightly. When I taught youth Sunday school back at Lorraine Avenue Mennonite Church in Wichita, Kansas in the early 2000s, we discovered Ruth is still one of the most popular names given to baby girls in North America. And in our class, similarly to the children's story today, in our class there was a girl named Ruth who after reading this lesson not surprisingly declared the book of Ruth to be her favorite. Interestingly, we discovered the same cannot be said about the heroic male character in the book, Boaz. Boaz doesn't even make the top 1,000 baby names. <laughs> Members of our class were surprised at this, saying, how could such a great Bible hero not be a popular name cho choice for a boy or a girl? One girl in our class, who seemed to be old beyond her years, lamented that you can't find a good man like Boaz these days. <laughs> and the following Sunday, she shared with us a dating website she had found for women with the tagline, waiting for your Boaz? Then you've come to the right place. <laughs> the, the point of sharing this Sunday school discussion with you is this. Youth wanted to talk about this story for more than one Sunday. The book of Ruth struck a nerve, and these kids were completely taken with the characters. Even removed from the religious context, people of all backgrounds desperately yearn to believe. All you need is love. As the Beatles' classic hit proclaimed, even in the turbulent, violent year of 1968. This past weekend, Jesse and I were in Philadelphia visiting our oldest daughter and our son-in-law, who had just moved to the center of the city on the 26th floor of an apartment complex near the University of Pennsylvania, where they will be attending school. They moved on Labor Day weekend from little sleepy Lawrence, Kansas. Quite a culture shock. But they're loving the city of brotherly love already. We did all the touristy things, seeing several historical sites, including the Liberty Bell and the old courthouse where the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution were signed. And we stood in lines to see these things. But the longest line that we stood in was the line that formed in Love Park around the iconic Love Sculpture, where people can stand under the bright red sculpture and get their pictures taken. Incidentally, that iconic sculpture was created by artist Robert Indiana shortly after JFK's assassination. Yes, love is a universal human yearning, perhaps especially so in turbulent and tragic times. Well, there are many lessons from the story of Ruth that speak to the universal human preoccupation with finding love. I think there are five takeaways that correspond to the five characters in the story. So first, what do we learn from Ruth? We learn unwavering love and devotion in the face of tragedy. What I find most notable about Ruth is that she is going through one of the most heartbreaking moments of her life. Her husband just died. She switched her allegiance to a new god. She clings to her mother-in-law, who, given their grim, grim circumstances, is not very pleasant right now. She goes to a new country as a foreigner, and then must work in a field to pick up leftover food. Despite these soul-breaking circumstances, Ruth remains undaunted. She's hardworking, loving, kind, faithful to her mother-in-law, and very, very brave. Ruth's declaration of love and loyalty for Naomi marks it as being the purest and most unselfish form of devotion. 
especially when we remember that Naomi was more than twice the age of Ruth and that proverbially it is not always easy to live with your mother-in-law. Second, what do we learn from Boaz? He is wealthy, kind, respected by his workers. He's attentive to lowly workers and outsiders. He honors the law cheerfully in regard to gleaning and the next of kin regulations before offering himself to Ruth. He reminds us we can bring redemption to excluded people. Boaz, I think, invites each of us to ask, who are the Moabites that we know? Who labors in exclusion? Who lives on leftovers? Who desperately needs to be noticed? Boaz invites us to remember how great it made you feel when you were noticed, maybe a newcomer, an outsider. Bill Robinson, President Emeritus of Whitworth College, a Presbyterian college in Spokane, Washington, tells of a conversation he overheard in a restaurant that I think beautifully underscores the importance of Boaz's attention to marginalized voices. Here is his story. A family of three was sitting at a table, getting ready to order. Their waitress first turned to the parents who made their choices from the menu. Then she turned to their five-year-old. And what will you have? She asked cheerily. I want a hot dog, the boy began. No hot dog, his mother interrupted. Just give him what we ordered. But the waitress, the waitress ignored the mother. Do you want ketchup on your hot dog? Ketchup, yes, the boy replied with a happy smile. Coming up, the waitress promised quickly, turning to the kitchen to deliver the order. There was an uncomfortable moment of silence at the table. Then the youngster turned to his mother and said, Mom, she thinks I'm real. (laughs) Indeed, in our biblical story, Boaz validates Ruth's presence He acknowledges again and again that she is real. In the end, Boaz teaches us not to forget, to be generous in the simple things and the greater things. Boaz sends Ruth away with barley in the amount beyond what she would have needed, a simple, rather ordinary thing. And then without hesitation, Boaz purchases Naomi's land provides her with financial assets, marries Ruth, provides for Ruth's long-term security, but also provides for that of Naomi, a much greater, extraordinary thing. Third, what do we learn from Naomi? I can identify with Naomi. I'm not only the mother of three adult children, but I've just recently become a mother-in-law for the second time. And believe me, I try very hard not to be too meddlesome or negative, but I guess you would have to ask my now two sons-in-law if that is true. It is difficult to overstate how serious Naomi's predicament was. In ancient times, being a widow without a son or a family was totally devastating since the extended family was the first and primary place she would go to find security and provision. This was especially true for Naomi, an older widow who would be less able to gain another husband. Even worse, Naomi was an alien in Moab, which compounded her social isolation and vulnerability. In terms of poverty and helplessness, Naomi's situation was the worst possible scenario someone living in Old Testament times could have endured. By the time they arrive in Bethlehem, Naomi's bitterness has deepened. In fact, when her old neighbors greet her, she says, Don't call me Naomi, call me bitter, for the Lord has gone out against me. So, you know, we may pity Naomi, But why should we identify with this bitter old woman? 
Well, I think we have to believe that before Naomi became bitter, she must have been an extremely loving and impressionable mother and mother-in-law. Why else would her two daughters-in-law plead to accompany her back to Bethlehem? And why would both girls cry inconsolably at the thought of losing Naomi? In some ways, considering her dire circumstances, Naomi was being kind to her daughters-in-law in turning them away. She decides to release them back to their own families because she believed if she, if she had somehow incurred the Lord's displeasure by going to Moab in the first place, why should they suffer along with her? Fourth, what do we learn from the townspeople? The Jewish people in the tale function much as a chorus in the Greek theater tradition. The townspeople provide enormous comfort and insight to Naomi. It is interesting to note that it is Naomi who is featured in the closing scene, not Ruth. The women of the city are delighted at the birth of the child. They come to congratulate Naomi rather than Ruth, and they ascribe what has happened to the hand of the Lord. The women of the town say, a son has been born to Naomi, not to Ruth. Why do they do this? To show, to show that it was not true what Naomi had said, that the Lord had brought her back empty from Moab. Further, these female observers declare to Naomi, your daughter-in-law, Ruth, who loves you, is far better to you than seven sons. This insight is of special significance in the male-dominated culture that Naomi lives in. For Naomi, Ruth's child is special. Naomi had expected a lonely, lonely old age when her husband and sons died, but only thanks to a woman. Ruth's generous devotion to her Everything, everything is now different for Naomi. She belongs to a family once again. She is loved, and she has a respectable place in society, indeed far better than seven sons. Fifth, what do we learn from God? The book of Ruth is a compelling story of God's extraordinary love and provision for those who trust and love God. Whether rich or poor, Ruth in her poverty, Boaz in his wealth, both are blessed as tremendous examples of generous spirits. Also, the story is about ordinary folk. There's no reference to royalty or genius or riches or beauty. Nothing that marks these characters as special or make them different that we couldn't imagine ourselves experiencing what they experience. And it is a reminder that God speaks through ordinary people, even as he sometimes positions us to examine and relate in extraordinary ways to others. And finally, we learn about inclusivity from God. First, that though Naomi wrestles with God, in the end, in the end, she gets loved by him as much as Ruth and Boaz. We learn that Ruth, a Gentile by birth, becomes the chosen line through which later the Savior of the world appears as Jesus came to redeem both Jew and Gentile alike. So these are five lessons that resonate with me from the story of Ruth. And these kinds of lessons from a great biblical love story are what we try to make real and aspire to model in our Mennonite church schools. Our philosophy of whole education in all our Mennonite schools, K through 12, and higher education is one that does not relegate 
great biblical love stories to the sidelines. We do not treat kindness as just a random, nice gesture disconnected from the story of God's love for us. At EMU, as many of you know, our mission is to prepare students to serve and lead in a global context in the spirit of Micah 6.8, to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with God. Our core values, discipleship, service, community building, global engagement, and peacemaking, intentionally position us to model the way of Jesus. Your bulletin inserts illustrate some of the ways that we are doing this every day. All of us can strive to be like Ruth or Boaz in performing or receiving extraordinary acts of love. But you know what? It's fine to extend ordinary acts of love, to be a good neighbor, or even be gracious in accepting undeserved grace from a loving God, to be a repentant believer like Naomi. The literary and intellectual giant of his age, Henry James, once said, there are three things that are important to human life. The first is to be kind. The second is to be kind. And the third is to be kind. In the spirit of broadly educating the whole student, our Mennonite schools strive to remember this most important virtue, to be kind, to redefine success by how well we very intentionally nourish head, hands, and heart. We need tough minds, yes. We need helping hands, yes. But most certainly, we need tender hearts inspired by the loving lives of the characters from the book of Ruth. Amen.